do bring humor to your like I mean as as I don't want to make it seem like pretentious as if this like ethereal saxophone community is is cutthroat, but at times it feels that way. And your your opinions often come off almost like counterculture y. Uh because it's you know, everyone's kinda got this 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 thing that they've been taught to like live and breathe um before they even yeah. understand what what the community is after after college um and so i i the way you're explaining it um like are you are you choosing your topics uh based off of controversy or are you choosing them based off of interest are you talking about a podcast specifically when i rail against academia and modern literature and stuff well, I mean, I guess either. Uh, also, what yeah. I think is so interesting is I get so I get different pieces of you based off of what I'm watching. Like watching you on sure is is nice, clean snippets of information that are giving your. It feels like your honest opinion, and it's helpful. Yeah, and it's done in a fun way, and it's always nice to no rant, very few rants in the YouTube. Yeah. The podcast is the podcast is a little yeah, and you get like you get to peel you peel back the layer, and you're like ah. I see where this comes from and how it it, it comes to earth. Yeah. Right. Like, where do you choose? Where do you where where do you decide what the what the line is on how far to to go? Like, you're you're you're. I, I, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I've said enough things on the podcast that would get me unequivocally fired from most academic jobs. So when I made the decision that I'm not going to pursue a career in academia, there was no line. I'm just speaking my honest truth, and I have the straight man uh, using the, you know, the idiom phrasing in Dr. Susan Fancher of arguing against me in that. But for me, it was <sighs> when I was, uh, I don't think graduate school for most people is a good thing to do. And I noticed when I was in school, whenever a student got accepted to graduate school at some state university that had not placed anyone in a full-time job in 30 years, but yet they're still taking graduate students hand over fist, um, they would get praise. Congratulations. Way to go. If anyone says I'm going to move to L.A. and become a mo an actress, they're like, don't be ridiculous. Look who you think you are. But yet we pl applaud going to grad school for a music career that's really not going to pan out because you're learning so much other stuff. You're really not. Sitting in a concert band for, you know, five hours a week, like you just learn to follow instructions. Um, like it, Or like learning to recreate. I had professors that would say I would try something. I remember playing Fuzzy Bird once. And I did something that I thought made, and I, to this day I'll argue, made a lot of musical sense and I executed it very well. And I got like, yeah, but that's not how Sagawa plays it. And I thought, well, who gives a flying two to how Sagawa, like, are we just a, a, a jukebox for what's already existed? And and so I think grad school is a terrible idea for most people. And I found I was literally the only person at the university where I was teaching music entrepreneurship saying like, yeah, don't go to grad school, like do something else. And like, they seemed really offended and really mad and i got called into the director's office because i would say yeah don't go to grad school or like uh yeah you're not going to get a full-time symphony job I, mean, I said that on the first day of class like look you're not going to get a full-time symphony job you need to plan for something else and the faculty complained they went to my director and complained and i thought can you name names wally <laughs> and i thought like all right you know well i'm very privileged i'm not going to starve to death if i didn't have the job my wife makes a full-time living so I'm very privileged in being able to say these things because I'm not worried about starving to death if I don't have an adjunct job, which is hilarious in itself. We'll get to another time. But so I remember looking my director in the eye and said, can you name one student in the past 20 years that has landed a full-time orchestra job? I'll wait. And he started laughing. He said, no. And I said, so what are we talking about here? How could, how is like, well, they said you're being too negative. It's like honesty is negativity. So how many state universities have performance majors where students want to be a full-time orchestra musician, but their professor has never won the job. And so I don't see as being contrarian. It's just like, I feel like I'm taking crazy pills and being the one to say these things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and it's not, no, no, no. Yeah. I don't, don't mean to cut you off, but like when I, when I say like counterculture, I really do mean like you're, it's not that your perspectives are invalid or <laughs> make them wrong or you're being controversial for the sake of controversy. No, you're right. No one else is saying it. Yeah, you're speaking to a niche that that resonates with a lot of people that have tried and and I don't want to say tried and failed, but have have tried to live what was being what is being teached. And you know, most people would learn a lot by just having that honest professor there in their program. Just the one, just one. That's because um, you just you just need. I, I, 
I get thank you notes several years after the fact, after they get out of grad school. And look, and I know people say, yeah, but it doesn't matter if you don't get the full-time job. Here's a study showing that getting a degree in the arts is good because you can land X, Y, Z other jobs. That's true. You could say the same thing out about our meditation retreat or chess club. But it's the time investment and more importantly, the expectation. I don't think anyone goes to grad school and performance thinking like, it's going to really prepare me to be an administrative assistant. They do it because of the love and the passion. For me, the biggest failing or the biggest unethical thing is it's setting them up for an unrealistic expectation and crushing depress depression, anxiety, disappointment, and low self-esteem. After they get that performance degree, they have jack crap for job prospects and they feel like a failure. When it was the professor who had no business accepting them in the first place to be a performance major in a doctorate. And I know professors that take doctor student after doctoral student after doctoral student that are piling up. There's people like flying out to audition for adjunct jobs. And to any listeners that don't know, adjunct jobs do not pay even remotely ethically. They're, they're a hobby. It's like being an NFL, I had, a cheerle I had a friend that was an NFL cheerleader. And I was like, well, what does that pay? She's like, no, it costs us money in the end. By the time we do the travel the uniforms and all that, we get like a small stipend. That's, but we do it because of the prestige. Everyone wants to be a cheerleader for the Dallas Cowboys. She was a cheerleader for the Patriots. Adjuncting is the same way. It's not any kind of income. It's just, we want to say I'm adjunct professor of saxophone at so-and-so university. So I exist in the profession. And so, yeah, there's, there's a lot of ethical problems with going on. And because I don't need to play the game anymore, I can speak honestly about it. No, that's, it's, it's refreshing. It's refreshing. And I'm sure it's why so many people. And, and you, I mean, don't name names, but do you know a good deal of people that have graduated from with performance degrees that suffer from some pretty severe depression and anxiety? Now, granted, that's like life, modern life in general. That, no, I know exactly what you mean. Um, the, so I always, I mean, everyone always likes to think that they're the exception to the rule. Um, but I took, I took a considerable amount of time off before I went back to my, like back to grad school and I went to grad school and I, yeah. you know, I didn't have to take out an obscene amount of debt because I got assistantships and I did everything. That's great. Because I, yeah. I, I lived, I lived in the real world before understanding what that burden is going to be like and what the expectations are after you finish. Um, right. But I saw plenty of people just, I mean, just the, 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 the triage of burning out thinking that you're, you know, it's one thing to make it through the first four years of undergrad practicing 30 hours a week and you do that for every week and you're like i'm this is great and then you get to a grad program and you're supposed to do it oh. more and then i mean and all you've ever done as an adult is live and breathe on your instrument and it's that that's it's not necessarily the most it's just not healthy at least. i agree um, yeah yeah as i'm canceling myself <laughs> as i as i submit all my adjunct position applications uh, no man um no, but it's, it's, some people it's it makes reality. sense it's a reality um yeah and and it's just i really do think it comes down to uh professors being honest with their students um but there's a there's a disincentive sometimes to be honest the other big problem i had with grad school is is i went back after having worked professionally for a number of years i went back to get my doctorate not because i wanted the doctor so much but my wife went to residency in the, in the city where I did my doctorate. And I was like, oh, I could get a job or I could go back to school. That sounds like more fun. <laughs> and I did that. And what I noticed was how poor the education was, not the courses, but so many of my hours were making the professor's projects work. So you're in the big bands. I'm not making creative decisions. I'm not learning how to teach. I'm learning to play a part via them telling me to play it better and instructing me. I'm not learning pedagogy because they're not telling me behind the process of what they're doing. And you could say, well, if you're more observant, maybe, but, or like, you know, then you go, I remember just, oh my God, sitting in the wind ensemble because there was a college band directors national association convention and we were premiering John Mackey pieces and everyone's so excited. John Mackey's fine. But I thought like, this is so many hours where like I had an alto solo that was on the little recording. And I remember like the director was micromanaging even how I played the solo. And I thought like, what am I learning? What am I paying for? I'm just making his ego work and for creating better recruitment tools and bragging rights for the university i'm learning nothing it's not valuable i wasn't taking leadership creative i wasn't allowed you know really and you could say like you should take initiative do your own projects you're so sucked for time no, it, it's you know 100 percent. yeah especially if you're you're yeah. being like weighed down with the labor of 
propping others up. Like it's that's difficult. Yeah, and then I was always told you gotta you gotta work with the composers and and commission new works and like. Yeah, it's so soul crushing, like commissioning a new work, waiting three months and getting something, a, a, a beep snort, multiphonic fest. And like, I don't want to play this. This is terrible. And I waited three months and now I feel obligated. And this is supposed to what I'm going to do to engage in the profession to have a career. No, thanks, man. I, when I took an I took an interim job and I remember like I uh, I met one of the composition faculty the first week I was there. And they're like, oh, while well, you're sax was I should write a piece for you. I was like, oh, God, please don't. Please, no, don't make me, no. Right, but the 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 profession is, you know, getting new works for this. It just wasn't for me. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think, Understandable. I mean, but, that, but everyone else is playing follow the follower. Everyone is doing that. And I was told when I was in grad school, well, like, this is what we do. And I'm like, well, then shouldn't some of us start not doing that, doing something different? Shouldn't some of us be working on more beginner pieces, more transcriptions for the adult amateur? Yeah. You know, shouldn't some of us be, why do we all have to pretend to be Tim McAllister? He's doing a damn good job of being Tim McAllister. Let him be Tim McAllister. The world has him. I need to be me. No, the end, well, I think you happen to also prove that in the, in the end result is by doing things your way, you got what you wanted. It, it, yes. And Grant, I have to acknowledge my privilege of being able to do that because my bills were paid while I built this. So I, I do need to acknowledge that, you know, there was not some magic bootstraps here. Like I, I, I had time to think about this without risk of being fired. Well, I was always at risk of being fired. I just didn't care. Yeah. Um, about making sure you paid the rent. Next but I think that feeling of being terrified and it's biologically ingrained. If you're the gazelle that gets singled out from the herd, you get eaten alive. And so everyone plays follow the follower. No one wants to. So their their way of innovating is commissioning a composer that maybe they never heard before or like, oh, bassoon, saxophone, and electronics. Woo! You know, and so like everyone's playing follow the follower in their careers and there's just not enough room for that. And the world doesn't need more of it, in my opinion. We need, and not everyone's meant to do that. No, sat saturating the market with something that... The market doesn't want is uh <laughs> right that's rough that's right like there's no other i mean uh, yeah no that's that's the same thing yeah i mean recruit recruitment has to be good because they ain't no ticket sales <laughs> oh yeah yeah and it's it's yeah it's a harsh reality especially if you want to like live in in that reality um but and the, yeah, the danger is it doesn't feel, I think it's highly irresponsible to go get a, a degree in performance for most people, but it's not seen as irresponsible. It's celebrated because it feels prestigious and it's in a beautiful brick building with people with doctorates in their name. Yeah. So what, I mean, really, if someone said, I'm going to go to LA and be a rapper, why is that any less realistic than I'm going to get a doctorate in saxophone performance? No, I mean, they're both goals are like genuinely just as difficult. Like I, I was I was in a hip hop group. Like that's what I did. I, oh, yeah. I, I turned down grad school too. Like I ran the band, I turned it into like company. Like we, we, we were doing, we were doing good. Um, and then when I like all that finished and I was like, I actually want to go back and get a doctorate in saxophone playing classical music. <laughs> and, it's, and it's like the, both of these things are just as outrageously hard to attain. But you think like, okay, but you, in your brain, you're probably thinking, well, I need job security. I need health insurance. I need some retirement plan. I got news for most saxophones. Adjunct jobs ain't giving you that. Oh, no. Yeah, 100%. And so I guess it really bugs me that I have professors also really wanting to, you know, promote you know, a good lifestyle for their students. They didn't, they're, they expect vacation. They expect dental and healthcare coverage. They expect to have a retirement plan, but their students need to go gig or work adjunct. And they're, they're fine with it. They don't lose sleep over that. And I was thinking like, well, you know, you got paternity leave. Don't you think that young student, she deserves maternity leave? Um, and I saw that literal, you know, like one of my students, uh, one of my professors, like, you know, he, he had two paternity leaves like in a row. And, but his students are telling him, just go to New York and gig. And I was like, do you not see the disconnect? What's goose, good for the goose should probably also be good for the gander in terms of health insurance and paid vacation. And so like, you know, the gig economy is terrible. No, um, it's, and it's, it, it's, it's like a, it's a terrifying thing that no one can teach you how to do because it's, it's dysfunctional. Like it's not a, it, it's not healthy. 
like I, yeah. I, I always I always joke with with my like saxophone friends like uh everyone says like jazz pays like pays compared to classical and I was like they're both they're both fantasy worlds if you want to make no. money off of okay. this. Yeah, so I had a friend that uh, teaches music performance majors in jazz. Unbelievably great at what they do. When the pandemic hit, he was deeply depressed because he thought, what am I teaching? My majors aren't, can't, no one's gigging, no one's performing, so what can my students do? And I had to say, person X, nothing has changed. None of your students were making a living playing to begin with, including the one that went to Juilliard. Yeah, the, the they teach. The coffee house is not right that yeah they're maybe down 75 bucks a week maybe 125 bucks a week yeah. um you know my you know minus out the gas money and they're not that you know like nothing changed and, they never and i think a, covid they, pulled back the curtain they never took a musical entrepreneurship course that prepared them for that life and understanding what goes into like just the bare minimums of tracking your mileage like when you when tax season comes, but that would imply that they would make enough money to write off anything. That's to not get the standard deduction. Yeah. No, no, most any gigging musician is not going to make more to not just claim the standard deduction anyway, which they think you need to track. Like, why are you teaching them to, to track? I was like, they're not making enough money to do that. They're just going to claim the standard deduction, you numb nut. If you spent one day outside of academia, you would know this. How many gigs do you play at one place before they're going to hand you like a 1099? Like, it's very simple. <laughs> like, yeah. But most people, we're never going to get there. So, yeah, the, the, it's funny that people think like, well, classical, you know, saxophone, yeah, but jazz musicians are making, they're not making money. There's just as much, you know, people say, well, don't take gigs for low money. It's hurting everyone else. Like, why shouldn't I be able to do my hobby in public? It's not my fault. It's not paying.